Holding my chest. My legs and hands. Silence. Feeling the pressure. What? She was a fool. It's a million bloody degrees out there. Oh, wind. I'm sorry if I said anything awful. Blessed lambs, of course. Why hadn't he got up to chop the capsicum? I was never a good reader. Ah, Immaculately bland. Anyway, it looks like... What do we do with this now? We're not even supposed to use the word fat. Boys like girls. When we were very young... I was back home in Norwich. Square Sound. You're listening to the audiobook podcast for the makers and listeners of audiobooks. Welcome to another audiobook podcast from the team here at Square Sound in Melbourne, Australia. I'm Justine Sloan Lees, and I'm here with the always wonderful Abby Holmes. Oh, thanks, Justine. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Yeah, so today we are discussing how to care for your voice when it's your work tool. Justine will be speaking with the lovely Rachel Titt, who's joining us to talk to us about this and her own work as an audiobook narrator. Rachel is no stranger in the performance community. She commenced her career as a musician and singer before training as an actor and voiceover artist. She's done everything from Brecht and Mamet to Shakespeare and Sondheim. She's worked across Australia for the MTC, STC, Malthouse, MSO and Theatre Works, to name a few. And her screen credits include Underbelly, The Sunset Six and The Man in Black, which is the Johnny Cash tribute show. Off stage, Rachel holds a Master's in Speech and Language Pathology and coaches voice, accents and dialogue. Well, Rachel, it's lovely to have you in the booth. It's lovely to be here. Thank you, Justine. And we are here later than we originally planned. We were meant to be in here together a couple of weeks ago and you got struck with a summer cold. I did. It's uh, having a six-year-old. That's all par for the course. But actually, that begs the question, are there times you really shouldn't be in the booth? Well, possibly, but in our line of work, you've kind of got to soldier on. So there are, you know, there are times where you just can't say no to a job and you paste yourself back together. There are certainly times where you shouldn't be doing eight shows a week if you're really ill, but, you know, it depends on the individual, I think. Yes, I've had to send someone home twice. Oh, have you? In 25 years, so. Wow, and everybody else just soldiers on. Yeah, I guess from our point of view, it's a consistency of voice. So if someone is recording a book over six sessions yeah. and they come in on the last day and they've got a really croaky voice or yeah. a you know head cold and they're completely stuffed up, the problem for us is that tone of voice. They might feel like they can keep working, but the tone of voice is not going to match yeah. what we've already done. Yeah. But we always encourage people if they think there's a problem, you know, that they're not going to be able to perform for some reason to let us know and we can work around it. Yeah, I think there's that um, that thing too for performers when they feel like their voice is slipping, they, they'll start to push and that produces a different tone again and makes them more prone to damaging their voice. So you've got years of experience as a singer, as an actor, and you're also a speech pathologist. Yes. So we really wanted to talk to you about vocal hygiene and how people can look after their voices and maximise that vocal resource for this kind of work. So we would love to pick your mind for your (laughs) top tips. Uh, Well, I know lots of people have different magic potions. People swear by licorice tea or... Pineapple juice, I've heard. Well, that was going to be my sort of go-to. A lot of people, obviously nothing is going to physically touch your vocal folds because they're in your windpipe, in your larynx. So unless you're drowning, that's no, <laughs> there's nothing you can directly apply to them, apart from steam, I suppose. And that feeds into just the idea of hydration, hydration, hydration. So... Pineapple juice, yes, contains an enzyme and kiwi fruit contains a similar enzyme that break proteins down. Not bought pineapple juice, I must stress, has to be fresh, fresh pineapple, fresh kiwi fruit. And that can help to break down mucus and other junk on your vocal folds. And I know a couple of sort of screamy, shouty rock singers who absolutely swear by something called pangdehai, which is the nut of a malva tree. They look like little brown kind of um, nuts and you put them into hot water and they produce a tea. The steam, again, probably helps. Yeah, that's a that's another tip that I haven't heard much. I've heard propolis. and Propolis, yes. Caroline Lee, who reads a great many audiobooks, she recommends propolis. It works for her. Mm. Uh, I was working not so long ago with Meow Meow, the cabaret performer, oh, yes. and she swears by some kind of organic tea called Throat Coat, tea with brown bark, licorice, marshmallow, cinnamon, <laughs> 
and all kinds of things. We discourage people from drinking coffee here unless they really feel they need it. And we have a large drawer full of lots of herbal teas. Yeah. And we recommend people drink those if they want a hot drink. And of course, I always have water to hand. But I think the uh, lemon ginger tea in particular, I think, seems to work on people. And we have honey as well. So Yeah. I mean, and, and all of those things, again, people who have their potions, I think there's a lot of psychological comfort that comes from having drinks or lollies or, or whatever. And, and if that helps to relax, to relieve tension, and that's a good thing too. Other than that, any way you can hydrate your voice is good. And as you say, coffee, decongestants, even aspirin can dry out your vocal folds. So anything that's going to dry you out should be avoided. I find quite a few people rely on lip balm. Right. Yeah. And obviously that's not going to affect your vocal cords, but they seem to think that it just helps with mouth noise and that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, people's mouths can get dry, obviously, in the booth and depending on whether they've been doing it very long or not, if they're nervous, that would definitely be a factor. Yeah. So what are your uh, top tips for warming up? Well, yawning is a great one because it opens up your soft palate and it sort of stretches the pharyngeal wall at the back of your throat. Anything you can do to wake up the resonators in your face, humming, is good if you start in a place of comfort for you range-wise and you can hum up or hum down like mmm, mmm. Trying to move the sound around your forehead, your nose, across your cheekbones and sort of trilling or up and down, it's virtually impossible to hurt your voice when you um, use a form of semi-occlusion like or singing into a, a glass of water with a straw, if that makes sense, if you can't do the thing with your lips. I know if people need a quiet way to warm up, if they can't yell and scream in the car on the way. <laughs> on the tram. <laughs> yeah, on the tram. Well, lots of people, you know, I, I've certainly gone to auditions and jobs where I've been on a tram or a train, and so nobody's going to look at you strangely if you're yawning. And humming, just really low humming. Mm. Yes, I've more than once paused to think about how many confused Uber drivers must drop people <laughs> off outside this building on a regular yeah. basis, wondering why this person sitting in the back seat making strange noises. Making weird noises, yeah. And after a session, is it a good idea to do anything after a session? You know, like when we do an exercise class, we stretch at the end of it. Yeah. Is there anything or is it just go home and not speak to anyone? Lots of hydration, lots of swallowing, lots of humming, just low humming, or being quiet. And I've heard people with voice issues before saying they whisper. Whispering's not necessarily a good thing either because you are adducting those vocal folds together in a way that could be strained. So you're better off not talking than whispering, really. I have to share a story with you. We had someone in recently who's never recorded a book before and she was starting on the Monday. So she said to her family on the Saturday evening and husband and three teenage children, I won't be speaking tomorrow. <laughs> and so she spent all day Sunday going around the house, going about her normal business. And she said it was brilliant because she'd hear the calls from all over the house, you know, Mum, where are my footy boots? Yeah. You know, Mum, he's feeding whizzies to the dog again, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And normally she'd respond, but because she wasn't speaking, mm. she didn't respond and she said in every instance they fixed whatever the problem was or Brilliant. resolved the issue because she'd hear them say, oh, mum mustn't be here because she wasn't <laughs> responding. I wonder if when they did talk to her, they spoke to her differently. Someone that I saw who had to have surgery for nodules wasn't allowed to speak for two weeks at all, no whispering, no, no noise making. And so she had a little book and she would go into shops and say, I've just had my vocal cords operated on, I can't speak. And then the next piece of paper said, I'm not deaf or stupid, I'm just not speaking at the moment. Because invariably when she showed them the first piece of paper, people would sh speak shout, loudly. Yeah, speak yeah. loudly and really slowly like she was somehow <laughs> mentally impaired. Now, I learned something interesting from you not so long ago, that your vocal cords don't have any pain receptors. No. So how no. do you know if you're doing the wrong thing or...? Well, there are obviously a lot of muscles and nerves around your vocal folds and I suppose the proof is in the pudding in terms of if you're feeling like you're not yourself vocally, then something's something's up. I mean, in my voice, I can still hear the fact that I've been coughing for the last week. But if something's up, you've just got to take a step back and people get sore throats and can still sing. I know I've done 
you know, had periods of doing eight shows a week where I've had tonsillitis and it doesn't affect my voice. And as long as I can stay hydrated and not stress, importantly, about the sort of pain elsewhere in my body, then, you know, you can get through it. So you can have a sore throat, but happy vocal cords. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Um, if you've got a sore throat that's not necessarily affecting the sound of your voice, you can do all the usual vocal hygiene things. And obviously, if that tension in your voice from the pain starts affecting the way your vocal folds perform, or if you've got a lot of phlegm, then it, it's obviously going to affect your voice. But I know plenty of singers who've had a sore throat from something else, not from vocal trauma or overuse who've managed to get through plenty of shows without further sort of hurting their voice. Sometimes I wonder if uh, doing particular accents places more strain on people's voices. For example, by and large, we cast people to narrate in something that's pretty much their natural kind of Mm. voice, their tone. Mm. But if you've got character voices within the text, I know that if there's a character in a text that's American, that as soon as someone goes into an American accent, they're normally louder they're punching it out more yeah. because that's how Americans speak. So well, is that more trying on the voice? It can be. And I'm glad you asked that question because I coach and do quite a bit of accent work. And often people will focus on the phonetics, the, on the sound of an accent without getting the music of an accent. Certainly the stereotypical Australian accent is sort of flatter and monotone than a lot of other parts of the world, where I think a lot of accents are inextricably tied to the geography of a place. The Scots, the Welsh have a, have a much bigger range, for example. Norwegians, Scandinavians have a much more sort of sing-songy yes. kind of... Um, mm-hmm. So a natural Australian speaker is going to push themselves into those other territories, then they have to be prepared for those extra demands. Most American accents, I find, like a Southern American accent is often quite close to an Australian accent, quite nasal in parts. I think Americans drive through to the ends of words and sentences much more than Australians do, which is why Australians struggle with music theatre sometimes, because they don't finish their words and finish their sentences. Yes, I I definitely hear that in the booth. mm, Mm. Like the pilgrims, like the Americans, are much more kind of righteous. And and possibly they're not always louder, they just sound louder because they drive their sentences through to the end, whereas we trail off, you know. Mm. And we're a mix, I guess. If you say a sentence like, I'm sorry I was late, there's a traffic jam, A lot of English people, a lot of Australian people, you'll just hear, sorry, late, traffic. Yeah. You won't hear, I am sorry, I am late. There was a traffic jam. You won't hear every single word like you might with an American person. Right. hmm. That's interesting. Yes, it certainly um, coincides with my experience. You're right. That comes into coaching a lot too. You can't trail off in in most American accents anyway. Hmm. We normally record people in four to five hour sessions, but some people struggle even at that. Other people can go all day and into the night (laughs) (laughs) in a quite extraordinary way, in a way that uh, sometimes I find exhausting because I'm the one sitting on the other side of the class and I'm still there. I had someone recently, I came in at 9.30 and we were booked to go to five and she just said, you know what, I don't want to come in tomorrow, I want to finish this book today. (gasps) And so I had to sit here. It was 7.30 in the evening when we finished. But she never waned. She is extraordinary. She's got a great deal of experience. Is it experience that lets her do that? I think it is. I mean, it's the same for performance of any description. And people ask me all the time, don't you get nervous doing that? And nerves are are the killer. You can't be an opera singer or sort of any kind of effective noisemaker if you're going to be shut down by nerves. I don't think that a a professional voice user should necessarily have to kind of run out of steam. Children can yell and scream all day. Babies can yell and scream all day. They're effective (laughs) noisemakers unburdened by nerves or any other sort of parameters. So it's kind of getting back to that in a way. And I think when I'm not in a vocal booth, I talk all day, talk all day, talk all day, yell and scream, yell up the stairs, get in the car, blah, blah, blah. I don't run out of voice then. I think the pressures of being in a booth in front of a microphone and trying to fit into the job that you are doing makes people use their voice in a different way that can tire them. So definitely experience and and being a professional helps. There's no other way to do it but just to clock up the hours. Clock up the booth hours, yes, indeed. 
Speaking of which, the last book you did in here with us was The Trauma Cleaner by Sarah Krasnerstein. And here's a sample from The Trauma Cleaner. It didn't start at the 20 buck fuck shops. It didn't start in the barn like brothel where the girls roosted like hens, wire on the windows and around the light bulbs to prevent the men from ripping them out of the ceiling. It didn't start with the boyfriends who stuck around only as long as her money lasted, or with the beatings from the cops who hated boys dressed like girls, or with the women who wouldn't open the door when she stood outside pleading in the dark, naked and bleeding. It didn't start with any of that. It started when she was a little boy in a small house with a dirt driveway running up along the side. Maybe his name was Glenn. Maybe it was Daniel or John or Mark or Tim. The actual name matters only because it is a piece of information that Sandra chooses to keep for herself. Statistically, it's most likely to have been Peter. And although that was not his actual name, it's what he'll be called not for lack of imagination, but because he had the right to be treated like any other boy born that year. And he was not. If his father drove in a straight line up the driveway, Peter knew he wouldn't be beaten. But if the car rolled in crooked, it meant his father had been drinking, which meant that he would wobble with purpose to the detached room out the back where his son lay, tensed, in whale mouth darkness. Amazing book. Oh, amazing book. Yeah. Do you have any particular tips in how you prepare that you think are worth sharing? Well, I think that book, as opposed to any other book I've done, had so many voices in it. There were so many different characters and people. I mean, there were whole chapters just about one new character that didn't reoccur anywhere else in the book. And if I can, I like to just read the book as a punter to start with, just read it for sense and an overarching narrative and flow and not read it with my booth mm. head on. And it was a well-written book. So there wasn't anything that leapt out like typos. And then I go back on it a second time and try and map it for myself, not with an idea of doing 40 different voices for 40 different characters, but just sort of separating things out a little bit to make it make more sense. And how do you find a voice for that character? What What is it you look for in the text to inform that decision? Well, in the case of the trauma cleaner, for example, I could Google the main character and, and yes. hear her voice. And I, and I didn't want to try and do an impersonation in any way. It's kind of about going out, bringing her to me, personalising her experiences to try and use my voice for her. And then kind of, you know, there are a lot of male characters in the book, so it's just sort of a flavour, sort of a wash to separate a person. I spent a lot of time thinking about all the different people and in the end what they meant for the main character in the book. I kind of like to leave something for the listener because when I read a book on a page, I hear the voices myself in my Mm -hmm. head and I don't want to be too prescriptive for the listener in an audio book where they sort of go, because I'm doing some kind of crazy vaudevillian character voice. So you want to leave something for the listener to do. Mm. So about you, you'd mentioned earlier you do coaching for dialects Mm -hmm. and also you work as a speech pathologist. So if people want to contact you and ask you about, ask you for your help in those areas, doable? Doable. They can contact me at voiceplay at yahoo.com. I'll have a new voice agent soon, but in terms of uh, coaching and speech therapy, voiceplay at yahoo.com. Great. Thanks for sharing your tips and advice based on all those years of experience you have. You're Um, very welcome. It's been lovely to be here and chat with you. Hopefully we'll be back together in the booth some other time or with me on the other side of the glass (laughs) and you in here reading. That would be great. Okay. Thanks, Justine. You've been listening to the audiobook podcast brought to you by Square Sound. If there's something that we haven't covered in our audiobook series that you'd like to know about, send us a message at studio.squaresound.com.au. The audiobook podcast was produced by Marianne Plaza together with Abby Holmes and Justine Sloan Lees. With special thanks to all our guest speakers, Square Sound is an audiobook and podcast studio in Melbourne, Australia. Thanks for listening. <laughs>